Okay, thank you, James, and uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm Alan from Quintessence. We are a startup in Santa Barbara working on photonics, uh, optical interconnects. And as James mentioned, I'd like to talk about dense wavelength division multiplex phot photonics for optical compute interconnects. So I don't think it's too bold of a statement to say that in the era of distributed computing, uh, communication is one of the key system level bottlenecks. And so this was highlighted in one of the keynotes yesterday, but this is an example from Microsoft of a AI training workload. And they show that as you scale to a larger number of parallel workers, the amount of time spent on communication uh, in terms of the total time it takes to execute a workload goes up. And you can see that as you get to 160 parallel GPUs, in this case, the total time spent on communication is almost 90%. So another way to think about it is 90% of the time you're running that AI training workload, your GPUs are sitting idle waiting for the all reduced step to complete, which is not a terribly efficient use of a, a valuable compute resource. And diving into this a little bit deeper, this plot shows the amount of energy in terms of picojoules per bit it takes to move data across various uh, distances. And so one thing to kind of point out is we can see that as soon as we get out of a, a single socket domain, or maybe the board level, you know, the amount of power or picojoules per bit it takes to move data goes up by a factor of 10. So at the package level, you know, on average, we're seeing powers of about a picojoules per bit. Um, once we escape out into the optical domain, which is in blue, you can see the slope kind of flattens out because attenuation of fiber tends to be relatively low. Um, but at that point, we've already kind of reached into the tens to 20 picojoules per bit domain. Um, and what this translates into which is shown on the plot on the right, is that because data centers have a fixed amount of power going to them, we can't afford to you know, send the same amount of data and also expend 10 times more power. And so what you have is, an in, in essence, uh, localized bandwidth. And for inter-accelerator bandwidth um, on the package and board level, they tend to be pretty high. This is an average of uh, a few different XPUs. I'll take a sample of around 2021 around two terabits per second of non-blocking <coughs> I.O. And then as soon as you get out of the, the server board, um, it drops by a factor of 10, and that's what results in that bottleneck that you show, or that I showed in the previous slide. And so to kind of remove that system level bottleneck, what you know, this suggests is we need uniform bandwidth and I.O. across all distance domains. And so that suggests that it should be optical because optics have unlimited reach. Um, but what's required is that we need to improve the technology so that not only can we move 10 times more data, but the peak joules per bit also has to drop by a factor of 10, so we're not burning more power. This is a white space chart that kind of illustrates you know, the various vectors and uh, among which we need to optimize. The three blue dots on the bottom for reference are existing technologies. These are plug ball transceivers, so the lowest blue dot is 100G. Uh, the middle one is 400G, and the far right one at the bottom is projections for 800 gigabit um, 2 by FR4 uh, instantiations in terms of bandwidth per fiber and bandwidth per watt. And I think for this application of optical compute interconnects, we really need to be driving towards the upper right corner um, to maximize both bandwidth while simultaneously reducing the power it takes to reduce that bandwidth. And so making the observation that a lot of these uh, electrical I.O. interfaces on accelerators are wide and parallel, the architecture that we kind of landed on is a wide and parallel optical architecture, which is high number of wavelengths, or DWDM. And that not only allows you to simultaneously maximize the bandwidth per fiber, um, but it also allows you to kind of radix match, quote unquote, to these wide and parallel low power interfaces, reducing the overall signal energy, and then we have a few other knobs to also drive down the power um, in terms of using heterogeneous integration and also on the design side to reduce the total loss on the photonic integrated circuit instantiation as well. This is an example, an early example of chip scale DWDM technology. And I think functionally it kind of captures the essence of what we'd like to achieve on the chip scale. Um, this is a indium phosphide photonic integrated circuit showing 40 different channels of uh, single wavelength tunable DFE lasers, each of them modulated by any phosphate EAM, and then mucks into a single fiber to achieve, I think on the order of 1.6 terabits per fiber. And so it has, you know, functionally, basically what we like to achieve, but 
I think we need to simplify a little bit more for use within the data center. Luckily, the technology, you know, there's been several technology advancements since the, you know, the past decade to kind of allow us to do that. The, the first one is that silicon photonics has come along, and most notably recently, DWDM silicon photonics. And so now we can sort of replace this array of 40 different indium phosphate EAMs and PDs plus the MUX and DMUX with just an array of micro ring based silicon photonic resonators uh, for the modulator and the detection. And that also simultaneously allows us to get rid of the MUX and DMUX because the wavelength selective functionality is already built in. And another thing that we've been working on at Quintessence is the ability to replicate the functionality of an array of these 40 different tunable DFE lasers with just a single multi-width and comb laser. And so this is key because otherwise, in order to scale bandwidth per fiber to add band, uh, by adding wavelengths, what we'd otherwise have to do is essentially pay for another laser each time we have to add an additional wavelength. And that scaling is a little bit prohibitive, as you, especially as you get into the high wavelength regime. You know, anytime you're talking about more than eight or 16 wavelengths. Um, and so in this instance, what we're shown is a single laser that's putting out in this case, 33 different parallel wavelengths. Each of those can be modulated and encoded with data to send over fiber. So these are how the Lego blocks kind of come together. So there's the multi-wavelength comb laser. Each of those wavelength lines is going to be modulated by a silicon tonic micro ring resonator on a silicon tonic chip, detected also on the same chip. That laser is enabled by a material called O-band quantum dot in Marsonite, gallium Marsonite quantum dots, it's a, it's a semiconductor material that we use to facilitate the generation of the multiple wavelengths. That leverages over 10 years of research from the Bowers Group at UC Santa Barbara. And ultimately, our goal is to sort of integrate both the laser and all of the other silicon tonic elements within the same chip. So you have a self-contained chiplet with all of the optical functions on it. I mentioned the quantum dots help to facilitate the, the multi-wavelength comb generation. There's also other advantages to using the material for lasers as well. Um, in particular, they can help to facilitate efficient operation across high temperatures, as shown on the upper right corner. That's important for operation in data centers. Um, they're fairly tolerant of spurious reflections, which can be a, an issue when you're manufacturing photonic integrated circuits and you have you know, process defects or whatnot that can generate uh, unwanted reflections result in MPI penalties. And also the material itself is very reliable uh, as relative to quantum well material. This is a, a sample of various kinds of comb lasers that we've made already. In general, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how we kind of design the combination of frequency spacing times the number of wavelengths out of a single comb laser. So we've demonstrated uh, at 25 gigahertz spacing, 100 wavelengths, um, 33 wavelengths at 50 gigahertz spacing, and we're also working on versions of 200 gigahertz spacing with eight wavelengths and 100 gigahertz. We've demonstrated we're also working on uh, other versions of it. In general, we can get total comb bandwidth on order of one to two terahertz, and that kind of nicely matches a FSR, a typical FSR of a silicon micro ring resonator. And one thing I forgot to mention is actually um, a nice properties of these comb lasers is that the wavelengths themselves are all kind of fixed relative to each other. So they kind of drift together, and, but while they drift, the, inter, the neighboring frequency spacing between the wavelengths is always constant. So we never have to worry about stabilizing individual lines, which you know, can be a big pain, or it was a big pain for traditional DWDM technology using single wavelength lasers. Uh, this is uh, another sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, result from early look results from some other comb lasers we've made. This is for a 50 gigahertz spacing design. And this illustrates that we can generate up to 6 dBm per lambda and also the average relative intensity noise per wavelength, which is important for closing links, can be as low as minus 160 dB per hertz. So, we're working on tightening the, dist the distribution here a bit more, but this is sort of a first look at the devices. And on average, we're seeing you know, the median of these values is around 2 dBm per lambda and minus 140 dB per hertz for the RIN, which is a pretty good starting point. And what we did with this data was we then fed it into some link simulations to kind of see, you know, is it feasible for us to create DWDM links where we use a comb laser to generate an array of multiple wavelengths 
to then be modulated and detected by a silicon tonic pick. Um, and so in general, our current studies show that we can support up to 56 gigabaud per lambda pretty, um, pretty comfortably. 112 gig looks like it won't be a walk in a park, but we think we'll be able to get there and we have a few different knobs to tune to get both the power up and also the run down to be able to support that modulation format. And in general, you know, the, lake, the peak jewel per bits on the laser side um, it's always it's looking pretty good in terms of you know sub one picojoule per bit expended on just the laser power, which traditionally has been a large chunk of the power for optical transceiver links. Um, and we're now working on we have test chips for these devices now for for the modulators and detectors, mid tapel. And our next step is to experimentally experimentally validate these link simulations and verify that that the link does close. In general, we have um, a lot of flexibility in terms of how we want to scale, both in terms of increasing the bandwidth for fiber and also driving down the power. Um, I showed before that we have flexibility in terms of trading off frequency spacing and number of wavelengths in a single comb laser. Another vector we have to scale is to use different wavelength bands. And uh, I'll be giving another talk this afternoon in the optics section where I explain the benefits of this architecture in a bit more detail. So if you're interested, please come check that out. Um, in general, our roadmap is to be able to skip or support up to 32 wavelengths per fiber, where each wavelength can be modulated up to 112 gig per lambda. And so at the high end of that range, that'll allow us to get to roughly 3.2 terabits per fiber. And I didn't show it here, but you know, we're targeting picojoules per bit on an order of you know, three or ideally less than three picojoules per bit in total. Another scaling vector is um, heterogeneous integration. And I mentioned earlier that our ultimate vision is to have everything integrated on the same chip, including a laser that has obvious benefits for reducing the fiber counts, re limiting the link loss associated with coupling an external laser to the like Metonics chip. And then if you can integrate the laser on the chip, you can also do integrated amplification. And so that then opens up a, a whole new sort of regime to be able to design links and re-optimize the laser power and the amplifier in conjunction or in the scope of the whole link to get to new architectures. Um, and we're actively working on this effort now. It's partially supported by the DARPA LUMOS program. And then, so I would like to end with maybe a vision of what I think is a, a, an exciting value proposition for this technology. And so, you know, this, this chiplet ecosystem um, that we've heard a lot about in the OCP uh, summit so far is sort of emerging. And in particular, chiplet interfaces like UCIE and a bunch of wires are emerging, and that's very promising for enabling an ecosystem of compatible chiplets. Um, in general, these wide and parallel interfaces, they deliver die to die like connectivity with low latency and low power, but the reach is limited to you know, maybe a few millimeters in the advanced package or maybe a centimeter if you're talking about an organic package. Um, what if we can make an optical version of that where we have an optical chiplet with everything self-contained that delivers the same die to die like connectivity but with unlimited reach? And so that's what you can do with this technology. And so imagine or take the case of UCIE, for example. There's an advanced version with 64 lanes. Each of those lanes is modulated at 32 gig NRZ. If you're able to build a, a, a DWDM silicon tonic chiplet, that can scale to any number of unlimited wavelengths, then you can do a one-to-one -one sort of wavelength to pin mapping, where each of those lengths then directly modulates a wavelength, and you get rid of the need for any sort of surdies, you preserve low latency and low power, but then the difference is now the chiplet can talk to any other chiplet anywhere across or anywhere else in the data center. And so now you can really think about this aggregation at the data center scale, in addition to scaling out at the data center scale. And so I'll end there, and uh, happy to take any questions. Okay.